I'm so excited today to take you to the studio of Gladys Sinclair. I don't know what I was expecting when I scheduled this visit with Gladys, but it certainly was not what I found. Gladys is just fabulous. I, I don't even know how else to describe her. Let's take a look at her studio and you'll see what I mean. Let's go. Hi, I'm Gladys Sinclair and welcome to my weaving studio in Waterloo. And this is one of my favorite rooms in the house. I have lots of finished weaving projects down here, but I also have lots of rug hooking and needlepoint and uh, paintings that I've done over the years. And it's just filled with lots of memories. So it's a great spot to be, put on some good classical music and there's no better place to be. We moved here to Waterloo 10 years ago when we realized that our three sons who went to university here were not coming back home and had settled in this area. So we decided that we needed to move down to be part of the gang. And when we bought this house, it basically had an unfinished basement, which was perfect. I took this half for my weaving studio and Jack has the other half for his woodworking workshop. We put down um, engineered hardwood floor, which has stood up really well put up some good track lighting and some paint on the walls and basically it was ready to move in. And just to give you a bit of background before then, I actually have a degree in nursing from McMaster University and I worked with the Victorian Order of Nurses in the Great Bruce area for a number of years. And when I was on my second maternity leave, I had an aunt in the area who was a wonderful weaver, Aunt Dorothy. And I asked her if she would teach me how to weave and she was more than thrilled for someone in the family to be interested in carrying on her tradition. So I went down to her home one night a week for about two months and she taught me the basics, how to make a warp, how to thread it, how to roll it on. We did a number of projects together. And then she sent me home and gave me this 27 inch loom which promptly found a home in my dining room. So for the next two years, I had Marguerite Davidson's book, I had a subscription to handwoven, and I just played. I did lots of different projects and had joined the Onsan Potawatomi Spinners and Weavers Guild and just learnt lots. And after our third son was born, I decided that I really wanted to be home with the boys, at least until they get into the school, and at the same time, just see where weaving led me. And amazingly, over the next few years, it led to the start of a old-fashioned cottage industry, much the same as what they used to have in Scotland hundreds of years ago. And the crofters had looms in their homes, they wove the yardage and took them to the woolen mills. Um, and it was so interesting for me to learn that one of my great-great-great-great-grandfathers was a weaver in Scotland. Really the business started when I saw a picture of a little top in a magazine and it wasn't even a hand woven magazine, it was just a little sleeveless cap sleeve linen top, it had a side stripe woven into it, it had a little crocheted lattice work on the shoulders and I thought I can do my version of that and, and did and loved wearing it, had lots of compliments and some friends who asked if I would make them some which led to a friend who said, yes, I want the top, but can you make me a skirt to go with it as well? And then someone else who said, yes, I like the top, but can you make it into a dress for me? And, and just by simple word of mouth, I was probably busier than I needed to be at that point. And just about that time in the mid eighties, uh, the high school teachers went on quite a lengthy strike. And after a while, my friend called and said she was sending over her grade nine daughter, Jody, and I was to teach her to weave until the strike ended. And I wasn't sure that was really what I would have planned, but over Jody came and turned out to be the perfect apprentice. She was just conscientious. She was a natural weaver. She ended up staying with me. She wove on Saturdays and summer holidays all the way through high school and then university. So then I had a friend who was interested in being part of the business as well. And she came over and worked with me in the studio until she had a feel for what we did and had woven a number of warps at my home. And then I found her a loom and she took it home and started weaving warps in her home. And I called the business Naturals Handwoven Clothing. And we wove a number of different fabrics in quite a range of colors and textures. And people would come to the studio or see me at a show and try on outfits that 
garments that fit them well, and then they could choose the fabrics that they wanted made out of. So they could um, try on one, one color of skirt and another color of a top. They didn't go together, but that gave us what we needed to make the outfits for them. And probably the most satisfaction I got from that business was working with customers who found it hard to buy off the rack. So most of us are not the perfect size, top and bottom, waistlines are not even, legs are not always the same length. Waistlines droop in the front, so your skirt droops in the front and goes up in the back. And people who had um, chemotherapy and one arm was chronically larger than the other. So it was so nice to work with these people and to make outfits for them that they felt good on and that look they looked good in. So this went on for about 30 years, which brings us to 2012 and our decision to move down here. And it just seemed like too daunting a process to move the business, to try and either do it long distance or to find new weavers or new sewers. So I decided I'd done it long enough. It was time to retire. Yeah, move down here. Um, and discovered that really I was not very good at retirement. And in a short while, I found I was weaving a line of home accessories. So tea towels, I love to do tea towels. It's just no end to the possibility of designs and colors. And then I started getting interested in rag weaving, upcycled weaving, and do a line of placemats and tablecloths and floor mats. I only brought the two looms down here with me. So I have my original 27 inch loom that Aunt Dorothy gave me. And that was 40 years ago, which is a scary thing to say. But I'm sure at that point, this loom was probably 30 or 40 years old at that point because Dorothy had it for a long time. And before that, it had belonged to another lady that had left it to Aunt Dorothy. So it's an elderly, but it's a goodie. It's my favorite loom and will always be my favorite loom. It fits me perfectly. It's a bright height. I can get in nice and close to thread the heddles. It's got a nice easy beater that I can work for hours on. And especially with my pillow. I didn't realize that there was a technical term called weaver's butt, but apparently Google says there is, and this is the answer to it. So it has, I fastened it on here with Velcro, but two holes in it. Um, and that takes the pressure off the iliac crust and the sciatic nerve, which can give you some leg problems. So this pillow moves from loom to loom with me. And just now I've got on a turn tackaday, which is something I've just discovered a couple of uh, months ago. And I, I love the possibilities for color and pattern on that. And it's also the perfect size loom to teach grandchildren how to weave. So my old wall warping mill is now the holder for my extra reeds and rattles and these sticks. And, and I do use tape measures, but more often than not, when I'm weaving towels or placemats, I've made up these um, guides for myself. So they just fasten on with little clips. Um, tells me what I need to know where the borders start, where the borders end, where the center is, where I need to start the border at the other end. So they always end up the perfect length and I'm not always having to stop and measure. So those have been handy to have. So I needed a spot to keep all my shuttles. They were always all over the place. So these were samples that I had woven at some time or other when I was trying out new weaves. So I just folded it in half, did some stitching across, and I've got some useful wall art to keep all of my shuttles in, space, in place. And the other loom I have is a 45 inch uh, counterbalance Leclerc loom. And it's a four harness as well. And while I admire work that's done on a 12 or 16 harness loom, I really have no desire to have one. I think I can spend the rest of my life exploring a four harness loom without getting bored. I read once that weaving was a combination of color and texture and pattern. And for me, it's the color that's most important. I like texture as well. Pattern, I tend to use simple weaves. I like a lot of twills, twills and basket weaves, tabbies. I use a bit of um, crackle and a pebble weave, but most of them are done in very simple weaves so that the colors really shine through. And I wanted to show you what I call my saddlebag. Often, um, some of the towels that I'm doing, there are 
13 color changes up through the towel. So Jack made this. It's got a little fin that just fits into there. I can put all my shuttles in order of the color and just leave. I don't have to stop and try and hunt the right one out of the uh, end of the loom. So I've got, uh, again, two of them if I need two on each end and they fit from bench to bench. And this is where we wind the bobbins. And again, this is a stool that uh, a friend of my mother's had made years ago and I hooked the seat for it. Sorry, it was way back in 78. So this has seen lots of bobbins being wound. My husband again made it for me. He's a handy guy. This is an old table leg and then a fan that he's converted and just with the rod through here that the shuttle speed on. So I've got a spot for the, the small, the large bobbins and then one at the bobbin for the garbage. And I often use two, if not three, two sixteens together when I'm weaving. Um, I just find it gives a lot more depth of color to the warp. But I was finding that if they're like this and they're different sizes and they're side by side, they never come off at the same rate. And I was always getting bubbling at the sides of the salvages, which was driving me crazy. So this was our solution for it. So there's a bottom post that the bottom one goes through. It comes up through the center hole there and then comes right up through the center of your top one, which is just on a, it's a wire that's fastened into there. They both come off and then they just wind off and never a bubble at the edge. Perfect. And then he's got one with three so these are at a bit of an angle so they come off smoothly and uh, I can do three two sixteens or three of whatever it is I want to blend in the orb. This is my mother's harvest table that you know when the leaf's up I've got lots of extra room to work that. Clock was a wedding gift to my husband's grandparents in about 1901. So lots of memories down here. This is my warping mill and it tucks really nicely into this corner. I can just pull it out when I want to use it. Generally, I put on nine and a half rounds. That gives me 25 yards and that gives me about 23 towels. And by then I'm ready to start something different. And this is a workshop that again, I took years and years ago on lace weaves. And uh, instead of just tucking away in a closet, I framed it and used it for some wall art. And I don't do a lot of scarves, but every once in a while, I'll put on a warp and do some scarves. I like using chenille and I always tell myself I'm just I'm using up my stash of chenille and invariably I end up ordering a few more colors so it's a never-ending process. But uh, clasp weft is probably one of my favorite techniques in scarves and these are so fun to do. You can just uh, make it up as you go along. And this is the same idea but just random pulls across. And these ones are also chenille and again just Transitioning slowly from one color to the other and using some clasp weft and a few metallic threads just gives it a bit of a tapestry look to it. And the first thing we did when we moved into this house was to weave a carpet for the stairs. So it, again, it was recycled fabric, did it as a rag rug. This has seen incredible wear in the last 10 years with a work working in a weaving shop both down here. It has stood up amazingly well probably going to have to replace it in the next few years, but I'll replace it with another rag rug. I have a spot over here with a computer and a printer that uh, I use mostly for printing uh, shipping labels. I have to admit that I'm mostly a paper and pencil girl most of the time, and I'm more comfortable with that. This is a, a rug that I, I hooked a number of things years ago, and I've just gotten back into hooking, and this was one I did during COVID. And this is a crock bright that, again, it, it's one of the first projects that I did uh, when I started weaving. And this is an important room. Um, okay. So this is used to be the cold storage room and Jack insulated it and drywalled it and painted it for me. Fitted it with shelves, so I've got lots of room for my 216s and my Orlex and my 28s and stash of uh, rayon chenille and odds and ends, all those things that you have great plans for using up at some point. And down at the far end is my stash of 
fabrics that I use for the red breathing. It's amazing what you find at thrift stores of bed linens, the, the colors and the quality and the patterns that people have had on their bed over the years. And it's hard to pass by a thrift store without going in to check what they have. And this is another rug that I've designed and hooked for our last home that I had in the kitchen. And it's found a new home here. And then a friend gave me my wicker basket and this is what I use to move yarns back and forth. And this is what's going on the warping mill next for the next round of tea towels. So that brings us back to my loom. And I wanted to tell you this, um, when I first started to weave, my aunt also encouraged me to take up spinning because that was her other great passion. And I went through the master spinner program at Georgian College. And this was part of the final project. We had to uh, do a hundred hour project. So I hand spun the yarn. It's all dyed with onion skins. And then I designed the pattern or adapted it from another pattern that I had seen in a rug hooking book and then hooked it. So that's been with me for a lot of years as well. And I think that's all I know. All right. <laughs> So you mentioned that your aunt taught you to weave, and um, clearly you've taken lots of other classes over the years. I really haven't. Um, you haven't? I really haven't. I, I, I tend to learn best figuring things out by myself. So I just uh, see a project that I like, whether it's in handwoven or, you know, patterns from Margaret Davidson, and just work away at figuring them out. So a lot of the weavers that I tend to meet with uh, belong to the OHS, the Ontario Handweavers and mm -hmm. Guild. Do you, are you part of that guild? No, I'm not. Actually. Do you belong to the guild here? I do. Ontario? I belong to the, the Kitchen Waterloo Spinners and Weavers Guild and it's it's a great guild to work with. So how, how much time do you spend in your studio? I'm seeing a lot of weaving around here. It looks like you spend all day every day down here. Is that true? No, I don't really. Um, I think I'm a fairly fast weaver, um, so I can put on a warp, make the warp and put it on in probably two to two and a half hours and that's a 25 yard warp. And then I can generally weave a towel in 20, 25, maybe 30 minutes. So, so I, and as I'm getting older too, so I'll probably only weave um, three or four towels in the morning and maybe three or four in the afternoon. And that may only take a couple of hours of the day. So, so no, you know, some days I'm down here a lot more. Some days I'm not down here at all. And that's the way I like it. It was, it was nice when I had the business with the clothing and to have the challenge of wearing so many different hats during the day. But it's also quite nice just being here and working by myself and having my music on. So it's sort of, I've had the best of both worlds. So I wanted to ask you about how people can buy your products. How do they find you? Where are you selling? They're welcome to come here to my studio um, and just give me a call ahead. Uh, welcome to come anytime. Um, we, our guild, the KW Spinners and Weaver, we put on a, a large show spring and fall um, that's very well attended and welcome to come there. I have done a number of shows in the past and that's usually how I've marketed my my things um, but I'm getting away from doing shows and I've just started uh, selling on Etsy so the name I go by on Etsy is Naturals Handwoven and welcome to check me out there and see what I have. Is there anything else you would like us to know about your fiber arts? I, I, I come from a long line of women in our family, my mother and grandmother and, and her mother, we've always had to be doing something with their hands. So I think I inherit that from them. And I credit my mother with, she had a wonderful sense of color. And I think I was fortunate enough to in, inherit that from her. So I just, I, I need to have projects on the go. I can't just sit and watch television. I love to read, but otherwise I need to be doing something. And I, I'm lucky enough, I also have a, the room over the garage, which is about 25 by 15 feet, and that's my craft room. 
So that's where I can do my painting and uh, do a lot of card making and rug hooking and so I can make a mess up there and just walk away from it. So, um, Can you tell me about your other fiber art? So you, you read, we know this, you do rug hooking, we've seen that. You do painting, we've seen that. What are we, have we not seen? Um, actually, I, I like to do, and I'll show you, my mother did a lot of crafts as well. She taught rug hooking and she was always crocheting and she was making both rugs and she was doing matching bedspreads for all the grandchildren. And when we're cleaning out her closet, I came across a bag of these fabrics, just silks and brocades. And in it, she had put a note to make an embroidered afghan if I ever get around to it, but she hadn't gotten around to it. So I brought it home and made the afghan. And I just used Orlac to do all the embroidery with. And it was one of those projects you just sort of had to say it's time to stop because you could have just gone on and on and on filling it with embroidery. So this is one of my very favorite pieces that I have. So beautiful. Yeah. Oh, it's, it's been well used. I like doing a, a number of, I like doing needlepoint and I go through phases. So I did rug hooking for a long time with mom, but then I got into weaving and weaving has sort of always been the stable. I'll go off and do needlepoint or I'll get into card making or I'll do something else. But weaving has always been the constant that I always come back to. And I like doing fiddly things. So this one is, um, I finger painted paper and then cut it into fine strips and again, rewove it. So just different things that uh, make interesting wall art. If you could have one more piece of equipment in your studio, what would it be? It would be a window. A window? Yes. <laughs> it's great lighting, but a window would be lovely, but it's not possible. So as far as equipment, I'm happy with what I've got. I don't really think of anything else that, uh, that I need. I like to keep things simple. Do you have any messages you'd like to send out since you have the attention of so many weavers? Anything you would like people to know? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, I guess just just play and enjoy what you're doing. You know, there's don't be afraid just to see a picture or to try and recreate something, either whether it's a painting or whether it's clothing. Just uh, just do your own thing and have fun with it. Thanks so much for watching. Please be sure to give it a thumbs up if you liked it. And if you like this video, you might also like this one or this one. I'll meet you there. Thanks for watching. Bye.